Hello everyone. Hi. Uh, welcome back. We're going to be starting with our second panel uh, entitled Competing Theories of Development or uh, following a few words from Sanjay Reddy earlier, maybe complementary theories of development. Uh, and uh, we, will, uh, we will start the panel uh, shortly, as long as everyone gets seated. Uh, uh, my name is Mohamed Barada, I'm a PhD student here at the New School and I will be uh, the chair of this panel. Uh, the first person I would like to uh, invite to speak is Professor Anwar Sheikh, who is Professor of Economics at the uh, NSSR and also the chair of our Economic Department and he will first start us, he will start us off, start us off by talking about development from a classical political economy perspective. Professor? Thank you. Um, let me just uh, let, remind people that there's also another conference going on in the room uh, upstairs, which is Feminism and Capitalism, which are two long days, and uh, it's jam-packed. So when you get a chance, come sneak by and take a look. It's, it's, uh, it's a characteristic of, of this place that both of these conferences are coming on at the same time. <laughs> 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 I want to start by saying that my interest in economics came from my interest in development. I come from Pakistan originally. My father traveled a lot, so we, my parents traveled a lot, so we were in different places. And I started to study economics because I wanted to try to understand the uneven nature of development that I encountered uh, in Nigeria, in Malaysia, in Kuwait. Uh, and of course, uh, in Turkey. And so I came to graduate school hoping to understand it and only to discover that what I learned had nothing whatsoever to do with the question that I was interested in. Uh, what I yes, what I quickly discovered was that the issue of development was based ultimately on standard uh, economic theory, micro and macro and on standard representations, one might say misrepresentations of how the developed economies actually work. Now the problem with development economics and the study of development is that it has to have a place to stand. It cannot just be a series of vignettes. If you're going to draw some implications, you have to have some guiding principles, and those guiding principles were almost always orthodox economics uh, and a story of how wonderful the West had been in, in rising to development. Um, and from this, people naturally developed, uh, uh, created different paths. One was a straightforward application of neoclassical theory to developed economies. That's a standard thing. Most development courses, even today, operate at that level. Then there are those who are more familiar with the history and structure of the developed world uh, allowed for modifications of the orthodox theory, uh, imperfections as they are called nowadays, in markets, institutions, and the state, which could account for the deviations between what the standard model says and what you find. And I call this imperfectionist theory, and it has, uh, it is now the dominant form because orthodox economics is literally unable to explain anything without requiring a set of imperfections. But if you add up the imperfections, you get nothing, because each of these imperfections has been uh, uh, adaptation or, or, or twisting of the theory to the local circumstance. And then when you try to use that, you say, well, no, you have to twist it a different way. I, th I think of it as a form of waterboarding of the theory. And that's the only case why I approve of waterboarding, but I don't think that's a good way to proceed theoretically. And then there's a third kind, which is an eclectic combination of theories, of imperfectionist theories, perfectionist theories, institutional theories, postmodern theories that makes up a story for each local circumstance. And I find these the least interesting because they are so ad hoc. Uh, some people like to consider this to be uh, a pluralist, but I prefer the term eclectic because they're not bound by any responsibility and consistency between their argument and anybody else's argument. Um, so I had very good teachers of 
expand the theory, I must say, the best. My micro teachers were Bill Dickley and uh, Jerry Decker. You may have heard of them. They did pretty well. <laughs> <laughs> Arthur Burns, who was the advisor to the Eisenhower government in the Council of Economic Advisors, and a person who had a very deep understanding about practical macro work. Uh, on trade theory, I had Peter Kennan and Ron Finley, who were major figures in the history of trade, and so on and so on. But my problem is from the start, I didn't find that the theory made any sense. My prior background was in engineering and some physics, and so I certainly understood the need to have a theory if you're going to build anything operative. I first studied aerospace and aeronautical engineering, and I can tell you that it is not enough to know the principles of physics to go into outer space. You really need to know a little bit more about how things work, because you can't find out halfway there that you left out some things that you need to continue, because you can't come back. <laughs> so I take theory very seriously as a foundation. In the same way that I would about building a, a spaceship, you really have to make sure you understand the principle, but you also need to make sure that every bolt is tightened and the whole thing hangs together. So I then, the question was, where do you go? If the orthodox theory, as I understood it, and I understood it pretty well because I did study it carefully, was uh, not plausible as a foundation. Uh, it's not plausible as a framework for the analysis of capitalism. If you know the history of how uh, marginal economics was invented, you know it was an attempt to move away from the conflicts that arose from uh, anti-capitalist movements and labor struggles and attempt to represent capitalism as an ideal and harmonious system. And that movement was precisely what motivated the so-called mathematization, which is a fiction. I mean, you can mathematize anything. The question is, what's the content of that mathematization? As my uh, mentor and, and uh, former colleague Robert Halbern used to say, what counts is the vision. The rest is just formalization and application. Then orthodox theory was also not a description of the developed capitalist world. The more I studied about how it worked in the center, which is the ground of where you want to go if you want to talk about, say, um, issues of dependency of post-colonial theory, issues of development of various sorts. So it's not a good description of, of developed capitalism. And from my point of view, therefore, was not a good description, not a good place as a point of departure. So where do you go then? I began to read, of course, <coughs> anthropology, which is one typically where one goes if you want to understand how people operate in sociology and political science, but also history. And then I went back to the classical communists, Smith and Ricardo and Marx, and then forward, so to speak, to Kolecki and Keynes. At least in my understanding of their analysis of the center, there was a coherent framework. A framework in which, despite Kolecki's uh, uh, defection from this uh, Originally, he started off on the basis of competition as a, in his theory of the macro, but then he defected to sort of imperfect competition. I concluded that you could make a coherent argument about how developed capitalism works, and that's the first step in order for me to move to the stage of how the development itself works uh, by uh, using certain principles. And those principles are that capitalism is strongly regulated by competition. Not competition understood in this bizarre and fictional manner of perfect competition, which was an invention designed to represent capitalism as harmonious, but actual competition, and I call it real competition, in order to distinguish it from perfect competition. I don't want to use the word imperfect, because for me, imperfect is the dual of perfect. If you say something is imperfect, then you're really already talking about the church and, and the original <laughs> trinity and all of that. And you're only talking about whether there were three or four or five. That's a detail. So uh, then the question is, from that point of view, how do you analyze capitalism in real competition? For me, clearly, the classics are a root, but you cannot do it without understanding the empirical evidence. Now, this is where my engineering background comes in handy because I'm able to parse empirical evidence. So 50% of the book, which is a result of this process, is empirical. And that's why there's so many nasty appendices there on how to 
go to national income accounts and calculate capital stocks and employment and all of that. Because you need to know, in order to explain something, you need to know how it is if you want to explain. You need to order the explanation, but you have to come to it from the study of the actual subject. So that's why I titled both capitalism and not, uh, say, economic theory and not classical economics, not history of thought. This is not a history of thought, but this is my understanding of how one should proceed to analyze the center itself. And then I want to build on the question how that, what that implies for development. So then, if the focus is capitalism, you have to ask how does it produce development and underdevelopment at the same time? Now that's not a new question, actually, because it's an old question in the Marxist literature and in many other literature that the same things that produce development produce underdevelopment. They produce wealth and they produce poverty. They produce people incorporated into the system and people displaced. Not all those displaced are picked up and some of those who were are displaced. The whole thing now in politics in the United States about people who have been displaced by foreign competition. And they're absolutely right. That is how competition works. The main point for me here is to say that it is not a question of the imperfection of competition, it is a question of the perfection of competition. That it not only elevates some, but it destroys others. It always has, from the beginning. Uh, Marx speaks specifically about competition as something that will break down the walls of other modes of production. But it also breaks down the walls of weaker competitors. And some of these are countries, some of these are regions. If we understand it that way, then we begin to see that competition is a gravitational field. It doesn't determine everything. It cannot just unfold from this magical formula the story of every country, but you have to understand it as a starting point that you make more concrete as you go along. Um, so then the question becomes, what does competition or what does capitalism do the best of all? And the answer is it makes profit. And it seems like a simple thing to say. It makes profit. But notice, this is not the answer that you get in orthodox economics, that it creates full employment, or it's efficient, or it's optimal. <coughs> None of that is true. What is true is that it is extremely good and efficient at making profit. Not at serving people, not creating a, a space for the environment, not technology per se, but extremely good at making profit. Two days ago, there was an article in the New York Times that there's a great need for malaria vaccines because malaria kills about 100,000 people every year, or hundreds of thousands of people every year. Uh, but there's no vaccine. And then the article mentioned in passing, why is there no vaccine? Because it's not profitable. It's a simple, trivial fact. It's not profitable. So how are you going to get these vaccines? You're going to have to pursue uh, some mechanism and an incentive to make it profitable to make Vaccine. At the same time, we're dealing with an environmental crisis which is on un unimaginable scale. Why is that? Because it was profitable. It's again obvious when you look historically. So I try to shy away from, in the first instance, from narratives that say it was a bad choice here. Of course, there are plenty of bad choices. We can list our own in infinite detail. But a bad choice here, a bad policy there, bad. If that's the only story you have, then the future is just dependent on getting the right people and the right policies, and you, you can just find anything. I think capitalism is extremely strong in producing some outcomes and blocking other outcomes. If you don't understand that part, then you will always be disappointed that the part you like doesn't work. If you want to manage the system, you have to manage it the way, the same way you would manage a nuclear reactor. You have to accept that it produces some terrible consequences which are part of the process that produces the energy that it produces. So if you want nuclear power, you have to take nuclear waste and radiation also. And this system is extremely powerful, extremely powerful, but its nuclear waste and radiation is also extremely powerful. But we have not yet talked here about the alternative to capitalism, and perhaps we won't, but it's stri striking to me here that the word socialism never came up here, and yet Bernie Sanders had 27,000 people <laughs> a few feet from here talking about socialism in the United States. So if we go from there, then what is the driving force of competition, uh, of the cap system? It's competition as a kind of war. 
the known orthodoxy economics competition is kind of bad. Everybody gets it, you know, and they get everybody happy. But in actual competition, everybody runs around trying to kill everybody else, and there is a difference. There's a certain amount of quality to war, but only if you look at it from a distance. And then when we're talking about competition, you have to distinguish between national and international competition. Because actually, competition is not by nations against nations. It's by capitals against other capitals. And insofar as the other capitals are located nationally, we see this national competition. And insofar as they're located internationally, then suddenly we recognize that international competition exists. For instance, right now, China is a bit noir for Americans because China is uh, selling many more goods to the U.S. than the U.S. is buying. That is because Chinese costs are low, and that's a fundamental principle of competition. Low costs give you a big advantage. They don't determine everything. <coughs> they give you a big advantage. The probability of success goes up tremendously if your costs are low. And China understands that, as did Japan before that, and South Korea before that, and Germany before that, that uh, low costs are a tool. <coughs> So you notice here that I'm not using the word monopoly of a champion. Uh, obviously, there are monopolies. But the size of a firm is not an index of its monopoly power. And in the book, I spend a lot of time talking about the empirical evidence uh, claiming that monopoly is present. And I point out that the, the key to whether something is a monopoly or not is whether its profits are higher as a profit rate. Because if it's bigger, <coughs> the profits are going to be higher in size, obviously is the rate of return higher. And I argue again and again, the empirical evidence shows that it is not the case. that size is itself a indicator of higher profit rates. In fact, one of the best known empirical phenomena in the business literature, which I read a fair amount, <coughs> is that the larger, firm, the larger the firm, the lower its profit rate. It's willing to accept the lower profit rate with scale because it also has a higher probability of survival. So you adjust the profit rate for the risk, you end up remarkably similar profit rates for small firms. Most of them fail very rapidly. And big firms will last a long time with the low rate of return, but a much more secure future. Now, that makes perfect sense on the theory of competition. For me, the theory of real competition. So anyway, when I started on this path in graduate school, that was 45 years ago, I wound my way yes, uh, towards something which was to show that it's possible to understand the developed capitalist world from the principles uh, of competition as war and of class and of power, uh, but not those as simply additive principles. They're regulated by their impact on competition. And so the subtitle of the book is Conflict and Crises, also inherent. Competition produces certain <coughs> outcomes. These outcomes are recurrent and they occur by overshooting and undershooting from balance. So there's no concept of equilibrium here, but there is a concept of some kind of uh, balance between too much and too little. I tried to use this to show, and of course, the, the next thing is that uh, inequality is a persistent outcome of competition. It's a natural outcome, and the book spent some time talking about historically as well as the modern work in econophysics on inequality, Piketty's work, and all of that. But the, my main point is you can derive these outcomes. It's not enough to say you can observe them. Yes, you can. That is important, actually. But you can derive them from very simple principles, and that's what I'm trying to show. State intervention should, it turns out to modify these outcomes, but it does not abolish them. In the last 85 years alone, in the developed capitalist world, supposedly the strongest case for capitalism, We've had the Great Depression of the 1930s, the stagflation crisis of the 1970s, and the current global crisis, which began in 2007 and 2008. And part of what I show in the book is that that global crisis was pretty much predictable. And here, in this uh, space, not this particular room, but uh, close by, I, I began to point out the outcomes that were leading to this in 2003. Um, and I predicted, I anticipated that they would come around 2009, uh, and I was off. It came a little bit earlier. Now, I didn't have any magic wand here. I was looking at observed patterns and looking at how they repeat, and that's a big point. What we're having now is a repetition. So in this framework, social and institutional factors play an important role because they modify and operate on competition. 
the state plays an important role in the same way that, that buildings play an important role in combating gravity, but they don't abolish gravity. That's a main point. Um, and there's no <coughs> reference whatsoever to uh, perfect individuals, perfect knowledge, perfect selfish behavior, rational expectations, or optimal outcomes. The outcomes you get are the outcomes that capitalism produces, which is the spread of profitability and the spread of capital. That does not imply employment. It does not imply <coughs> development. Where it develops is something much more concrete. And I also argue against imperfect competition theories, some of which are rooted in post-Kingian economics and dependency theory, for instance, and uh, to some extent in post-colonial uh, arguments and subaltern arguments, because I think those rely on perfection. You cannot have imperfection without perfection. And most of the idea of accepting the perfection framework in order to modify it. So <clears throat> let me just list very briefly what the book covers in terms of theoretical derivation and empirical application. Uh, in every case, I develop an alternate argument to the neoclassical and Keynesian, post-Keynesian ones on the following topics. On the uh, derivation of microeconomic demand and supply curves, which I show following my teacher, Gary Becker, that you can do without any reference to the utility, maximi utility maximizing optimality of anything of any sort. Collective behavior of individuals produces a distribution, and that's sufficient to show you can get downward sloping demand curves, consumption functions, and all of that. So you can do the microeconomics of the consumer without any reference to the nonsense that economists have to begin from. We can talk about feminist economics. We can talk about race and gender and class and nationality as determinant of individual behavior and still explain why we get certain patterns that we call micro patterns. The theories of wages and profits, both theoretically and empirically, technical change, relative prices of goods and services. I have a lot of empirical evidence on that. Interest rates, a theory of interest rates, empirical evidence over hundreds of years, yes, uh, bonded equity prices, exchange rates, patterns of trade, and that's very important for development, growth, unemployment, inflation, national and <coughs> personal inequality, and the recurrence of general crises. Now, to just end here, note that many of the outcomes that I mentioned have their counterparts in the issue of development. International trade is very important, both as protectionism and, say, the debates about import substitution. The mobility of capital is national, but when we talk about international, we talk about FDI. What regulates FDI? Why is it there? Uh, and how, what effect does it have? Modernization, which is uh, an issue in every development context, and the displacement of labor that goes along with it, and the pickup of labor, and they're not equal. They can be unequal, different conditions, international competition, uh, as I mentioned China before, on a global scale, which is driven by low cost, first of all, not only because states can intervene and subsidize and modify, but they modify it in the same way that an architect modifies gravity. You don't abolish it, you try to use it. And that leads me to two questions. I would argue that capitalism is not very elastic at the core, but it's elastic around the edges. And this gives the false impression and you can lead capitalism in any direction you want. I argue at some length against Keynesian ideas that you <coughs> create full employment, because I argue that capitalism actually reproduces the unemployment. Not necessarily where you're pumping it up, it may come somewhere else. But you have to be responsible for the effects of, uh, overall effects of these interventions. I don't think that it can, in fact, create a full employment at all, and certainly that raises the question, what about the role of gender? Can you create full employment for women and men everywhere in the world? I don't think so. So it's not just an issue of gender. It's also an issue of the displacement that can take place as one part displaces another. Much of the politics in the US is driven now by bitter white men who are reason to be bitter, by the way, because they have, in fact, been displaced by immigrants, by non-white <coughs> people, and women. That's not a secret. Can you have development for all? Well, I don't think so. The whole point of competition is they have to be losers. So if you're going to subscribe to capitalism, then you should also subscribe to the fact that somebody has to lose. <coughs> Otherwise, you want to talk about something else. Uh, 
and the last point is, I urge people not to confuse concrete with what Sanjay uh, used the word uh, mud. Do I know what he means by that? Which is the concrete, the details. To move from the abstract to the concrete, you have to be able to build in the steps in between. You can't just jump. And those steps get you down to the mud. But that's not the same thing as being muddled. You can get down in the mud and muck around and say, well, it could be this or it could be that, and it's all dependent. And you're not telling anything except, at best, a description, and at worst, a mud. So I think the role that theory plays is to give you a guide to move from the basic principles down to the concrete applications, which are conditional on many historical factors and local factors, but then should be understood as concrete expressions of some basic principles. Biology proceeds that way, physics proceeds that way, and I think economics could proceed that way once you get rid of the nonsense that is what we call orthodox economics. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. I would like to now pass the mic to uh, uh, Professor Jan Mudud, who is a professor of economics at Sarah Lawrence College and an alumni of this very department. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the invitation. And uh, it's good to be back over here and speak to familiar, some familiar faces and not so familiar faces here. Um, can you hear me? Okay, um, so what I want to do here is I want, I, I'm in a kind of an un unenviable situation over here. I want to um, provide you with some insights about um, the World Bank um, coming from the study of law and its intersection with political economy. But in order to do that, I need to spend a few minutes talking about the law, especially with regard to property. Um, uh, because this plays a very central role in the World Bank's, uh, it always has, but in over the past uh, about 20 years, it's become a very important role in terms of its claims to uh, reduce poverty and so on and so forth. Um, for me, the, the theoretical question of property itself becomes a kind of a crucial issue. Um, the theory becomes very important for me uh, as an alum of this school his former student. Um, <coughs> parallels are eerie. I'm originally from Pakistan also. Traveled, my dad was a diplomat, and I also came in as an engineer. Electrical <laughs> 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 very bizarre. It's a, it's a very bizarre story here. But anyway, um, what I want to do here is I want to give you a very brief summary of the so-called third moment in law and development. Uh, uh, in uh, in regards to the World Bank, which uh, which has, uh, so this third moment is the equivalent of uh, what is called the post-Washington consensus or third wave politics, and it's uh, 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 David Kennedy has called it chastened neoliberalism, uh, in the sense that the focus is on um, uh, market imperfections, market failures, and uh, just for the record, um, when. I know this is being recorded, just, so, just know that I'm putting word market failure and externalities within quotes, <laughs> because I want to suggest that in fact the theory of property that I'm going to briefly talk about completely invalidates this notion, these notions of market imperfections. Um, Hernando de Soto's classic book, The Mystery of Capital, Why Capitalism Primes the West and Fails Everywhere Else, in which he talks about creating property rights for, um, for um, uh, in the uh, informal sector, this, this becomes a kind of an important uh, document uh, uh, to, that inspires the third of scholarship. Okay? Microfinance and uh, microenterprises, all about creating private property rights as a way, in the third moment perspective, to uh, not only reduce poverty but create social justice and so on and so forth. Now, uh, one critical scholar, a legal scholar, Alvaro Santos, has called this an incoherent hodgepodge uh, of all kinds of uh, issues. And I want to uh, illustrate the hodgepodge uh, as I go along. Now, I've been studying for the past few years uh, a particular critical tradition in law called critical legal studies, which um, 
uh, goes back uh, to the legal realists of the late 19th century, early 20th century, and particularly focused on the work of Robert Lee Hale, who was a professor at Columbia Law School. So a lot of my insights uh, that I'm going to talk about today come from Hale and other realists, especially uh, Wesley Hofeld. Um, now, uh, the view of, so, so the focus here is on property and how property is conceptualized. Uh, the realists rejected the notion that property is um, a Robinson Crusoe-like entity where you have this relationship with this thing. Right? Property was always seen in terms of the effects that property has on other property owners and non-property owners. So property was, in the realist perspective, was always seen in social and relational terms. There was no way that you could ever talk about property in a Robinson Crusoe sense. Property was always social and relational. Um, and this implied that, uh, that, uh, that um, property then uh, had to deal with the, the, the notion of property was seen as one of bundles of rights in which your use of your property and its impact on other people um, and how the damage that they could do to you would be contained or not by the existing legal system. And how the legal system itself came about is something that I want to come to later on. Okay. So in this view, then, property governs relations between persons with respect to things rather than relations of persons to things. Um, at the heart of Hale's perspective was the view that private property relations in capitalism are fundamentally coercive because of the very nature of the fact that what I do on my property always will have some impact on you and what you do will have some impact on mine. Um, you cannot, you could not conceptualize property as a kind of a disembodied atomistic thing. Uh, there was a professor over here many years ago, a man called Stephen Heimer, who wrote a classic article called Robinson Crusoe on the Secret of Primitive Accumulation. And there's a beautiful line in that. If you've not read this article, read it. He says, when Robinson Crusoe captures uh, the slave, he says, Robinson Crusoe has his servant, and economy is born. <laughs> OK? And that's the point. That there was, so for me, the critical legal studies perspective has some eerie parallels with classical political or critical political economy in the sense of its emphasis on the sphere of private property relations as being fundamentally coercive. Um, uh, so that as, um, uh, you know, and, and I'll illustrate this in a little bit. Each time the law, as this is Gregory Alexander's a, a law professor at Cornell, each time, Alexander said, each time the law protects one person's security by recognizing in that person a right, which implies a correlative duty on others or a privilege which imposes on others what Hofeld calls a no right, the law unavoidably denies others corresponding security. Okay, so for example, the classic example was um, that's used is uh, uh, is Lochner versus the State of New York, uh, 1905, where the Supreme Court uh, overturned a statute which had uh, in New York which had restricted the number of hours of work of workers in the bakery industry, and the Supreme Court said no, this was not constitutional. This this interfered with the freedom of, of free bargaining between capital and labor. Okay. The legal realist response was, well, well, yeah, once you move the law back and you do not restrict working hours, then of course you give power to capital to dictate the terms of that relationship. In the same way that if you do not have laws uh, that prohibit domestic violence, then of course that gives the ability for violence to happen within the household. It gives it permissions. So the law gives as much uh, prohibition as it gives permission for, uh, for power to be exercised. Okay. Now, Hale's point was that, in fact, the sphere of the private, the private sphere is as much a sphere of coercion as that the coercion associated with the government. In other words, the standard neoclassical view is that here's a free market, right, the free market, and here's the government, and the government imposes coercion. Hill's point was, the realist point was, that in fact, the coercive relations exist within the private sphere itself. Then the question becomes, how does the existing system of laws structure the bargaining relations between 
the state and capital, or between property owners and non-property owners, etc. <coughs> now, uh, how am I doing on time? Okay. Um, we still have five more minutes. Okay. <laughs> um, so, the so uh, there's actually a beautiful quote here from uh, Hale's Freedom Through Law, uh, and I won't read it. But his basic point there is that the Constitution guarantees uh, private property in the sense that if the government does something, you have recourse to the Constitution. Capitalists have recourse to the Constitution if their freedom is taken away. But on the other hand, if non-owners of property talk about their, their freedom being taken away, they cannot have recourse to the Constitution. Because it's, that's not, at least in the US context, that's not the way the Constitution works. Now there are some implications over this. OK, so one implication is that private actions will always have social implications, positive or negative. Why barbecue in my backyard? That's going to pollute the neighborhood. If I start a factory, it'll have, if I raise a building to the ground in downtown Manhattan, that will have some impacts. Now, the point here is that if property ownership and property laws are, are, are social and relational, then quote unquote externalities are ubiquitous. Right? Now, if externalities are ubiquitous, you see where I'm going with this. If externalities are ubiquitous, then so-called market failures are also ubiquitous. But if market failures are ubiquitous, <laughs> they're not market failures anymore. They're just markets. That's exactly what you mean by the clash of coercive power between a rival property owner. There is no perfection. There is no imperfection. There is just markets. Okay. Now, on the question of perfect competition, it is interesting to note that legal scholars have long recognized, and one I, I, I refer you to Morton Horvitz's The Transformation of American Law, 1780 to 1860, uh, in which he points out that, in fact, it was always recognized that competition involves legalized injury. Always, right? Uh, there was, in other words, there was never any golden age of capitalism where the perfect competition prevailed. The, law, uh, the legal profession was very aware that uh, it was inherently destructive, and so the question then becomes how you fix it, and that's that's a, another uh, that's another story. So as as Horvitz said, the essential attribute of property ownership was the power to develop one's property regardless of the injurious consequences to others. Right. So this is you know a sort of a, uh, you know a point made by a legal historian, which kind of again debunks the notion of an imperfect market or imperfect competition. Okay. So I want to move further down, and what are the implications of all of this? Well, one implication of all of this is Hale's point is that, in fact, laws can change. You can change the bundle of rights of property owners. But there are limits to how far you can go. And he talks explicitly about the wage profit trade-off. Right? In other words, that wages, as he says, rising beyond a certain level will reduce the incentive to invest. Okay? Um, so, Property relations then are, you know, they are what they are, constructed through the political process and political, through legal struggles. But there are, there, you know, in other words, the, the point here is that if you're thinking in terms of progressive policies, and that's what the legal realists were talking about when they were talking about New Deal policies and so on, they were very aware of the fact that, in fact, policy, uh, this is my own analogy, is rather like a seesaw. The sense that it's, it's inherently unstable. You can try to balance the social with business needs or capitalist needs, but there's always an element of instability <coughs> involved in the construction of such a, such a policy. I mean, we, we're so used to in economics of conceptualizing policy as, you know, just increase G, and it's going to do the job, <laughs> or free the free the market, and it's going to it's going to do the job. I think that. Is very deeply problematic. Very deep, deeply problematic. Problematic. Um, authors uh, in this tradition have referred to the destabilizing nature of property, um, and I want to. I've run out of time, but uh, maybe we can pick up on this later on. But I just want to say that th there is an issue here which. I wanted, this was a juicy part of my talk. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to say this. Which is about 
political struggles. And uh, while there are many factors that determine political struggles, um, one of the issues that has come up sometimes here is, is a question of ideational, uh, uh, of ideational issues, which is that how do you even conceptualize the um, formulation, uh, how do you conceptualize um, theorizing about capitalism and alternatives to it, right, within capitalism or outside it. And here, law and economics has played a very central role funded by conservative foundations such as the Olin Foundation and so on in pushing those ubiquitous supply-demand curves and focusing on microeconomics and the teaching of <coughs> law and economics at the elite law schools such as Harvard Law School where their target was the critical legal scholars. In fact, the battles were so violent at Harvard in the 1980s that Harvard was known as the Beirut of law schools because of the enormous fight between the left, critical legal scholars, and law and economics. So many of us are involved in this alternative law and political economy as a way to sort of push back uh, uh, against that. And um, from my own perspective, that means bringing in insights from classical or critical political economy and the study that some of the most interesting insights from the realist and the uh, critical legal traditions. Thank you.